Well, last week we finished up our sermon series, God Strengthen Our Weakness, when we went through 2 Corinthians. We're now beginning our another sermon series, I believe, about the Apostles' Creed. And so we're, this morning we're gonna be in Acts chapter 17, verses 22 through 31. You can turn there in your own Bibles or follow along on the screen. Again, Acts chapter 17, verses 22 through 31. Let's hear from the Lord this morning. So Paul standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man." The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed the day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Let's pray. God the Father, we are so grateful that you are a loving and gracious and kind Father who is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Thank you that you love your kids perfectly when we wander and are disobedient. God, you love us, and you love us by sending your son Jesus to die for us. And God, I pray that as we encounter your word this morning that we would be left not unchanged, but rather we would see your beauty of who you are more and more as a loving, gracious, all-powerful Father. Pray for Pastor Trent as he gets up to deliver the word that you have given to him this week, God. I pray that it would be powerful and bold and courageous and that we would see more of your mercy for your people. And I pray all this in Jesus' powerful name, amen. You may be seated. His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and and was buried. The third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he shall come to judge the living and the dead. Creo Espíritu Santo. The communion of the saints. The resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Amen. I believe. I love seeing all those people in our church family and confessing what they believe. We are starting a new series today called I Believe. It is a study essentially of the Apostles' Creed. The reason for this, of course, is because what we believe ultimately shapes how we live. What you believe shapes how you live. Now, not just simply the things that you say you believe, but those beliefs that have actually made their way down into the very core of your being, that are so much a part of who you are that that you almost don't even think about them. They just, the, the, the lens through which you're seeing the world, those are the things that shape the way you live your life. What you believe shapes how you live. For example, if you believe that the world is flat and just at the very core of who you are, you just know this to be true. You believe that the world is flat, which there are still some folks who are believing that. In any case, if you believe that the world is flat, then you will 
probably not venture to sail out very close to the horizon, right? For fear of falling off into the oblivion. Likewise, if you believe that the world is spherical and that you could actually circumnavigate it, if you happen to be an explorer, you, you might attempt something like that. What you believe would shape how you live. Likewise, if you believe in the core of your being that you are worthless, that will shape how you live. It shapes how you see the world. It shapes how you see yourself. And if you believe that you're superior to other people because of your race or because of your background or your education or any other reason, that's gonna shape how you live, how you engage with people in the world, how you see yourself, and so on. Well, Christianity is a set of convictions. It's a set of beliefs. It's not only that, but it is that. It's a set of things that we believe to be true and a set of things that we believe to be true that actually shape the way we live in the world moment by moment and day by day. And what we wanna do in the course of this series is two things. One, we want to walk you through the Apostles' Creed and help make sure that the things you believe are actually the things that are true according to the Scripture. We want to make sure you understand what these fundamental truths of our faith actually are. And then secondly, we want, you to, we want to help you work out the implications of what these truths, what these beliefs actually mean for your life. So that when you say these words, I believe, and the things that follow, that it wouldn't simply be the expression of your mouth, but that these would be the defining truths that govern your whole life. So that's what we're gonna be doing. Let's talk about the Apostles' Creed. The first thing you need to know about the Apostles' Creed is that it was not written by the apostles. It was commonly thought for a very long time that the apostles actually did write this creed, which is probably why it's called the Apostles' Creed. But the Apostles' Creed, in its earliest development, probably developed around the second century, and then came to its, close to its present um, form that we just heard recited for us, somewhere around the fifth of the sixth century. So even though the apostles didn't write it, however, it is a helpful short summary of the things that the apostles teach, which we read about in the scripture. And for that reason, from very early on in church history, People have been using the Apostles' Creed to disciple new believers and to prepare them for baptism or for participating in the Lord's Supper. It's a great short summary. In fact, this week during VBS, we're going to be doing our communicants class, which is preparing uh, some of our students for participating in the Lord's Supper. And the backbone of that instruction is the Apostles' Creed. It is a very helpful summary of what the Bible teaches. So we're going to be working our way through that and our hope is that uh, these, uh, these words, as you say them, and as we recite them in the service, and as you recite it, as you go on down through your life, you would recognize that this is not a logical statement of abstract doctrines, but a profession of living facts and saving truths. So that every time you recite it, it would be uh, a, a rehearsal of the very truths that shape your life, how you live in the world moment by moment. Now, as we work our way through this creed, we won't be doing what we like to ordinarily do here, which is to preach our way through the books of the Bible, but because this is kind of a compilation of a lot of biblical truths in this document, we're gonna be jumping around to a lot of different parts of the Bible as we make our way through the series this summer. We're starting in Acts chapter 17 with this statement, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Now, in Acts chapter 17, the Apostle Paul is addressing a group of people who are not Christians and they're not Jews, and he starts with where they are as a religious people, and he builds a bridge from there to the truth of Scripture, namely, the truths that we confess when we say, I believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth. So, three things we want to see, or we will see, as we look at our text this morning, and the first is that our God, the one we say we believe in, he is the maker of heaven and earth. Look with me at the beginning of Paul's speech in verse 22. He says, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. So he's speaking to these people who are very religious. In other words, as he walks through the town, he sees they have all kinds of religious paraphernalia. They've got their idols, they've got their temples. And he says, I see about you that you're a religious people. You're a worshiping people. 
Now, today, if you were to say to somebody, I see that you're very religious, they would probably be offended. Right? Even Christians, we don't like to be called religious, right? We're not religious people, we're spiritual people. But the bottom line is, just like the people of that day were worshiping, so also people today, we're worshiping as well. And we are, in fact, very religious, whether we recognize it or not. All of us. The great divide in humanity is not between those who believe in some sort of God and those who do not believe in God whatsoever. The great divide of humanity is between those who trust in the God of the Bible and those who trust in false gods. That's the divide. Do you know and worship the God of the Bible or do you serve idols? Now, again, in Athens, the idols were very apparent. There were little stone images. There were, there were creations. There were representations of these gods in various temples, and people would go to the shrines, and they would worship. They'd offer sacrifices and so on. They worshiped the god of war. They worshiped the goddess of beauty, the goddess of wealth and of, um, of fertility. These were the gods whom they were worshiping. We don't have these gods set up around uh, in our various places where we go and intentionally and consciously are worshiping Aphrodite or Artemis or somebody like that. But you can rest assured we're still worshiping the same gods. Tim Keller in his book on idolatry says, each one of these gods has its shrines, whether office towers, spas and gems, studios or stadiums, where sacrifices must be made in order to procure the blessings of the good life and ward off disaster. What are the gods of beauty, power, money, and achievement, but the same things that have assumed mythic proportion, proportions in our individual lives and in our society? We're still worshiping the same gods in different kinds of ways, but these are the places that we've been looking to for ultimate meaning and have been for, well, since the beginning. What is an idol? If, if, we, if we're saying we're, we worship we worship false gods. People are inclined to worship false gods, but we're not actually worshiping little stone statues and wood statues and so on. What exactly is an idol? Again, Keller writes, anything more important to you than God, anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God, anything you seek to give you, what only God can give. That's an idol. Something you're looking to to give you what only the God of the Bible can actually give give you. It's not that people don't worship or they worship the God of the Bible. It's you worship the God of the Bible or you're worshiping and looking to a false God for those things that are nearest to you. Now, amongst these things, as Paul continues his speech, he says, I came across an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. And Paul sees here an opportunity to springboard from this to the message of the gospel. Why did the Athenians have a altar to the unknown God? Well, they were a people who had a pantheon of gods. They recognized and worshiped a number of different gods, but they had this one altar dedicated to the unknown God because they were self-aware enough to know that they, though they worshiped a number of different gods, they may have missed somebody. There may be a God that they didn't know about yet, and they did not want to offend this God and potentially bring disastrous consequences upon themselves for not worshiping uh, him or her. And so this is essentially, uh, many understand it to be essentially an insurance policy. We worship the gods that we know, but this is a protection to, so that we haven't offended this God who's expecting our worship, but we aren't giving them. Well, Paul says, this God that you're Worshiping as the unknown one, let me tell you who he is. Let me tell you who he is. He goes on. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. In other words, that one God that you don't know is the only one that matters. He's the one who made everything. And he doesn't live in any of these temples and you can't serve him with your hands. You can't give him anything that he needs because everything you have, it came from him. This is the one God who's worthy of worship. He's the maker of all and he's the Lord and ruler of all. 
The fact that God is the maker of all, the Bible sees as significant, and so should we. In fact, the very first words of the entire book, Genesis 1-1, start this way. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The first thing you need to understand about the God of the Bible, the one true God, is that he's the one who has created everything, everything in the heavens and the earth, in the physical world and the spiritual world. He is the creator of all. Now, as we look around the world, we see things that aren't quite right. We see things that are not the way they're supposed to be. And the scripture helps us understand what happened there in the third chapter of the Bible as it introduces us to the concept of human rebellion against God called sin. But the first thing we learned about him is that he's the creator of all and he created all things good. That's what Genesis chapter one and chapter two are about. Now, since the days of Charles Darwin and the development of the theory of evolution, Christians have begun to read Genesis one and two in a way that's not the way it was intended to be read. The point of the opening chapters of the Bible is not primarily to show us the creation, but to introduce us to the creator. It wasn't written primarily to give us knowledge of physical science, but to give us the knowledge of God. Genesis 1 and 2 is essentially saying, you see the creation, you see the birds in the sky, you see the planets, you see everything around you. Let me tell you who's the one responsible. It is the God of the Bible. He's the creator of all of these things. He is the maker of heaven and earth. And the rest of the Bible is essentially aiming to give us knowledge of who this God is, to reveal his heart to us and to reveal his plan for all things. That's what the Bible is ultimately about. It's about him. But as we read through the scripture, we find that the Bible oftentimes communicates to us about God in ways that that we can understand. Because one of the things that's true about God is that he is, theologians say, he is incomprehensible. That doesn't mean that he's not knowable. It means that he's incomprehensible. That you can't comprehensively understand or explain him. He is beyond comprehension. You will spend eternity going deeper and deeper into understanding who this God is and never get to the bottom. He's that great, so much greater than us. We in our house have a cat who lives with us. Her name is Bailey. She's a fascinating creature when she's not sleeping. Not often. But I, I did some research into cats, and there are experts on this. They're called cat behaviorists. And these people try to understand how cats think which is in itself a fascinating (laughs) attempt to understand how cats think. I love cats, by the way. That's why we have one. But but what I discovered from these experts who studied this, and as best they can tell, what they know about cats is that cats don't think of you humans as humans. Cats think of you as basically big cats who are kind of clumsy and a little bit slow on the uptake. That's how they understand you. And, and so you can appreciate the great patience cats show with us as humans, given that they think we're just cats who aren't very good at being cats. And they seem to know what needs to be done and when it needs to be done and how it needs to be done. And, and they, they're, they're patient and un, and with us in understanding that we don't quite get it, but we seem to be learning. So that's how cats see us as people. Now, as I was thinking about this, it it struck me, cats don't have any ability to comprehend what a human being actually is. Uh, We're so much greater than them in the sense of the order of creation that they can't can't comprehend what a human being is. There's just too much to, to grasp. And so they have to reduce us to something they can understand. We're basically just big, dumb cats. Now consider this, as, greater than, uh, as, as great as we are, as more great we are than cats, how in the world do I say this? A cat could say it, right? <laughs> Even though we're much greater than cats, God is infinitely greater than us. And if cats aren't able to comprehend us and reduce us to something more like they can understand, we also are inclined to do the same thing with God. We, we reduce him to being something far more like us. In fact, we 
We tend to think of God, particularly in times of trouble and when we don't understand, we tend to think of him as just basically being a big human being who's sometimes a little slow on the uptake. He doesn't get it. We have to set him right. We have to help him understand how things should be. Just like a cat. Our God, the Bible says, is omnipotent, which means he has all power. There's no power that he doesn't have. He has everything. He can do all his holy will. Whatever he wants and wills to do, he does. We can't fathom what it means to be all powerful. Our God is omniscient, which means he, is, he knows everything. There's nothing he doesn't know and can't know. There's no, he doesn't learn. He has known all from the beginning to the end. He knows everything, always. We can't begin to fathom what that's like, but, but that's who he is. Our God is omnipresent. He is everywhere, all at once, through space and time. There's nowhere where he's not. You can't go anywhere where he hasn't already been forever and will be. He's, we can't fathom his omnipresence. He's self-sufficient. He looks to no one or nothing for what he needs. He has always been, from eternity past to eternity future, self-sufficient in, in every way. We can't fathom this God, and we certainly dare not reduce him to being just kind of a big, slightly dumber version of us. He is beyond our comprehension. He is the maker of heaven and earth. What are the implications of the fact that this incomprehensible God is the maker of earth? Everything, the one we say we believe in. Let me give you just a couple implications, and I encourage you just to, to go home and think about today, what, what difference does it make in my life that the God I serve and believe in is the maker of everything? Here's a couple of them. First of all, we know that we're not here by chance or accident. The Bible says he's the maker of everything. Everything you can see, everything you can't see, including human beings, including you. You are not here by chance. You are not an accident. You are not a, a, a gradual working out of implications in the universe. You were created by God. You have worth in that sense. You have purpose in that sense. He made you. And, and your role in this world is to discover your maker, to seek him, and then to bring your life into alignment with his plan for you as it's written in the scriptures. You're not here by accident. Your life is not pointless. It's not purposeless. It's very intentional. Read the book. Seek this God. And ask him, how then should I live if you are who you say you are and I am who you say I am? Secondly, the second implication is this is my father's world. If the God I believe in is the maker of heaven and earth, then this is my father's world. And though the wrongs seem off so strong, God is the ruler yet. He's still the ruler. Things as they are are not the way they're supposed to be, but that does not mean that God has lost control. He's all-powerful, and he is all-powerfully and all-wisely working out his sovereign plan for all of the universe, including you. And he will not fail in this task. The Bible tells us where he's moving all of history, how he's working it out from the beginning of the fall in Genesis chapter three through the pages of scripture on through history, God is working out his sovereign plan to liberate that which has come to be enslaved through sin. And what the scripture says is that at the end, all of creation is going to be set free from its bondage to decay, including his people are going to be free. What does it mean to live in that freedom? What does it mean to live in line with the trajectory for all of the universe in which God is making all things new? Are you living in alignment with what the creator is doing in this world? Or are you at cross purposes with him? Because you, if, you, if you live at cross purposes with the one who has come to set all things free from its bondage to sin and decay, and you become part of the decay and part of the opposition to God's plan, one day you will discover you've run into a buzzsaw. Our 
calling is to recognize that the Lord, the one of Scripture, is the maker and to turn our lives and to bring it into alignment with what he's doing. I believe in God, the maker of heaven and earth. Do you? What difference is it making? Secondly, our God is the Father Almighty. He's the Father Almighty. Continuing in verse 26. This God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he's actually not far from each one of us, for, quoting one of their poets, in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. He's making a case against idolatry. If you're his offspring, then you shouldn't be worshiping things that you make out of stone and wood or whatever else we make our idols out of today. This creator is the father of all in this sense. He is the creator of all. As the scripture says, he made from one man every nation of mankind. There is a sense in which there is a a universal brotherhood of mankind. Christians can affirm that and believe that and recognize that we are all related in this sense. That Adam is our common ancestor. Whatever your, whatever your racial background, these are, these are divisions that we have come and added in that were not part of God's original design to identify ourselves in these ways, but rather to identify and recognize ourselves as members of the human race, as children of God. Now, to say that we are his offspring, which is what the Scripture says here, He's quoting one of their poets who's actually talking about Zeus. Now, Paul's not affirming that we're Zeus's offspring, but he's taking that line that they attributed to Zeus, and he's saying, this is true of the God of the Bible, the maker of heaven and earth. We're his offspring. All of us, we're made by him. Now, some people have mistakenly taken that to mean if we're all God's children, then we're all going to be with God forever. But the scripture makes it clear that there's a distinction between being God's child by creation and being his adopted child through the redemption that Jesus accomplished. So if you've not been brought into the family of God through the work of Jesus, Then the Bible says, while you may be a child of God by creation, you're actually a child of wrath. And you're destined for destruction. So how do we who are the children of wrath, because of our rebellion against God into which we've all been born, we've all been born into this rebellion that started with Adam. We're all part of running against God's plan for the universe. That's how we are by nature. How do we become people who are running in the direction of God's plan? How do we actually live as his children? And the answer the Bible gives has to do with God's only son, Jesus. See, God the Father didn't become God the Father when he created humanity. In fact, God the Father never became God the Father. He has always been God the Father, the Father of God the Son, Jesus Christ. He's always been the father as Jesus has always been the son. And because of human sin, God sent his son into the world to come and to take our sins upon himself because our sin is what separates us from God the father. Jesus the son came and took our sins upon himself so that we who were at enmity with God because of our sin could be reconciled to the father. So, Your relationship to the Father hinges on your relationship to God the Son. And you cannot come to God the Father except that you come to him through Jesus Christ the Son. John tells us this in John chapter 1. He says, but to all who did receive him, that is Jesus, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, 
Who gives that right to become the children of God? The reference here is to Jesus. It is Jesus who gives the right to become the children of God because it is Jesus who has done the work to necessary to reconcile you to God the Father. It, only through trusting in Jesus do you have the right to become the children of God. 1 John 3, verses 1 and 2 says, See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, and so we are. Beloved, we are God's children. We are God's children through faith in Jesus Christ. Because of the love of God, you who were not his children but children of wrath have now been brought in, adopted into his family. You're called by his name and you have all the rights and the privileges afforded to the sons of God. That's a statement that every time we read it should just cause us to marvel. It should just be an astounding thing that, that we, that we, clowns as we are, should be called children of the most high God, the maker of all. Can you say that? That you are because of your relationship to Jesus Christ that you are a child of God. If so, I want you to know that that's not a, that's not a, a position that you're going to grow into. He says, this is what we are right now, today, through faith in Jesus. You are God's child, called by his name, protected under his protection, provided for from his provision, loved as he loves his only son, Jesus. We don't simply say, I believe in God the Father, though. We say, I believe in God the Father Almighty. We shouldn't overlook the significance of that adjective. He is the Almighty. He's the sovereign God. Again, it means he is able to do and willing to do all his holy will. There is nothing and no one that keeps God, our Father, from accomplishing everything he has purposed to do. This is what we're talking about when we talk about God's sovereignty. He's sovereign in salvation. He's sovereign in creation. He's sovereign in outworkings of the plan of redemption. He's sovereign in everything and over all. J.I. Packer says that men treat God's sovereignty as a theme for controversy, but in Scripture, it's a matter for worship. That when you discover that God is sovereign over all, the first response should be to praise him. As the psalmist says in Psalm 97, the Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice. God is sovereign. Your response should be hallelujah. Hallelujah. No matter what I see today, the Lord reigns. Hallelujah. No matter how bad it looks, no matter how much it seems like things can't possibly turn out well, the Lord reigns. And we say hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's because God is sovereign that we can have any confidence in the promises of Scripture. Those precious promises, promises like Romans 8, 28, which says, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. How can you know that? How can you know that for sure? You can know it for sure because God is sovereign, because nobody can keep him from working everything together for your good. No one can stop him. No one can trip him up. No one can make him stumble the slightest bit. No one can delay his plan. We know all things are working together for those, for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Because he's all powerful. Because he does what he wants to and that's what he wants to do. You believe in God the Father Almighty? Today? Today? In the midst of your situation, in the midst of things that just don't seem to be making any sense, in the midst of the hardship, the trial, the difficulty, do you believe in God the Father Almighty? J.I. Packer says, the truth of God's almightiness in creation, providence, and grace is the basis of all our trust, peace, and joy in God, and the safeguard of all our hopes of answered prayer, present protection, and final salvation. It means that neither fate, 
nor the stars, nor blind chance, nor man's folly, nor Satan's malice controls this world. Instead, a morally perfect God runs it, and none can dethrone him or thwart his purposes of love. Amen. If you wake up in the morning, you say, I believe in God the Father Almighty. And if you forget what that means, go back and read that quote to yourself. It means that my God, nothing can stop him. No one can stop him. No one else reigns today but him. And I know what direction he's reigning. I know what his intentions are. And I know no one can keep him from his intentions. He will succeed. So, What are the implications of this? First of all, we can approach him as children approach a father who loves them. If if you believe in God the Father Almighty, he's your father, then you can approach him as a beloved child approaches a beloved father. Jesus taught us to pray, our father who art in heaven. He expects you to come to him like a child goes to their parent. I love that video at the beginning and we see all the different ways that dad answers, all the different ways and situations in life when, when dad answers the call. Well, all of those are times when you can call out to your father in heaven and he will just as surely be there, whatever it is. Secondly, we can trust him to provide for us. We can trust him to provide for us. He is, after all, supplying your very breath right now. You live in him and move in him and have your being in him. He supplies you with everything you have. Surely you can trust him to provide for things less important than breath. You trust him such. Thirdly, we can trust him to never leave us because he's a good father and good fathers don't leave. That's what he's like. And it's that confidence in that the fact that God, the Father, won't leave us that that actually shapes how we live in the world. And Hebrews 13.5 draws out this implication. See, in other words, the truths of Scripture and the truths about God are actually to shape the way we live in the world. Here's one application of that. Hebrews 13.5 says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Well, on what basis? On this basis, God said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So don't trust in money when you should be trusting in God. Keep your life free of that. And what are the other implications of the fact that God said, I'm never going to leave you or forsake you? I don't know. Begin to work it out, though. If God's never going to leave me and he's never going to forsake me, and I believe that in the core of who I am, what would change about the way I feel right now? What would change about my thoughts regarding the future if I know that God's going to be there all along the way? Work out these implications. Allow the things you believe to actually shape your life. As I, as I was thinking about this this week, I just thought, my goodness, if I really believe God is my father, I should just, I should, there's in many ways, I should just be walking around on sunshine all the time. Even in the midst of hardship, to be able to say, Yeah, this is tough, but my goodness, I'm a child of God. He's my father who loves me and takes care of me and has has made these precious promises to me. Oh my goodness, it's more than enough. Some of you had really good fathers. And when you think about God as father, it's really easy for you to imagine a father who's gonna provide for you physically and spiritually and emotionally. What a gift. Honor those fathers today. And know this, that as great as your earthly father is, he's just a dim shadow of your father in heaven. Can you believe that there is a a father who's even greater than yours? There is. (laughs) Some of you have a hard time imagining God as a good father because you had a father who wasn't good. He didn't provide for you physically, spiritually, emotionally. Maybe he did leave. Maybe he didn't even know him. I just want to remind you that your father in heaven is not like that. He is what we've said in this passage. This week I had a chance to be with the men's group, uh, Covenant Men on Tuesday night. Such a great group. When they start again in the fall, men, I encourage all of you to be a part of this. It's such a powerful thing happening amongst these men. But I heard a, a man talk about the fact that he never knew his earthly father. He's gone before he was uh, 
aware. And, and he talked about, though, how he's discovered what it means to have God as his father. And he's found in God the Father more than anything that he lost in not having an earthly father. Now, that's a process. But it's, it's, it's learning to grow in faith to believe what the scripture says about God our Father. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. The third piece of this then is that our God, who is the Father, the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, he also commands all people to repent. And that's where Paul brings his message to a close. He says in verse 30, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which He will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. The times of ignorance God has overlooked. In other words, you maybe haven't been worshiping God up to this point. God has overlooked it. He hasn't brought upon you the consequences of your disobedience and your disregard of him. But he says the day is coming. In fact, it's fixed when he's going to judge the world. And it's going to be a perfect judgment, and he's going to judge all people. Every one of you will be under this judgment. And the basis of the judgment is, how have you related to God the Son? The one who is going to be the judge on that day is none other than Jesus Christ. The good news for you who believe in Jesus, who trust in Jesus, is that your judge is the one who's died for you and risen again and promised to come and save you. And so the day of judgment is is something which we do not fear, but which we long for and anticipate, because on that day, everything wrong is going to be made right. Everything. But if you have rejected Jesus Christ the Son, You cannot expect a welcome reception from God the Father because it was God the Father who sent God the Son for you. And so he's commanding all people everywhere. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter where you were born. Doesn't matter what color you are, what your background, how moral, how immoral. Doesn't matter. All people commanded to repent. That that simply means one thing. It means to turn around. To turn around. You see, Paul said earlier that God created us to seek him. He made us to seek God. And, and Paul tells us elsewhere in Romans chapter 3, but though God made us to seek him, not a single one of us seeks him. There's no one that seeks him. That's the power of sin. God made us to seek him, and there's not one, no, not one, who is righteous, not one who seeks him in the whole world. That's what sin has done to you. And Paul says, none of us seek him, but he's actually not far from us. Well, where is he? He's right behind you. He's right behind you. The one place you won't turn around. And he says, God's telling everybody right now, turn around. You've been running from him your whole life. You've gone from God to God to God. You've you've looked to thing to thing to thing. And now, now... God says, turn around, and there you'll find me. Stop running away from me. Turn and run to me. That's the invitation. And here's the promise. He will receive you. To all who receive him, you get the right to become the children of God. Not born of the flesh or the will of man, but of God. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth? If not, I invite you to believe in him today through faith in Jesus Christ, the son. And if you do believe in him, then I invite you to to go deep in starting to meditate on and reflect on the implications of that belief. How is it shaping your life today that you believe in God, the father almighty maker of heaven and earth? I believe in God, the father almighty maker of heaven and earth. And I pray that you do too. And together we'll move into what that means. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the grace to turn around, to stop running from you, and to learn what it means to run into the arms of a father who stands ready with compassion 
to forgive everything. If only we'll just turn and run. There are some here this morning who are running from you still, Lord. And I pray for your work of sovereign grace in their life to stop running away. And that this morning they'll say to you, all right, I'm done. I'm turning around. I'm coming to you. I want to know God the Father through Christ the Son. Lord, I pray that they will turn and they'll discover you in all of your goodness and all of your love and mercy and that you'll just turn their whole world upside down, rather right side up. And Lord, for us who believe, help us to go deeper in the implications and living out the truth of what we confess and believe. May we find you to be the good, good father that you have said that you are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.